It's sweet, of course, because I get to worship with you all this morning. I get to praise our God together with you all. As I was coming to church this morning to be with you all, I thought of the words by David in Psalm 122, a beautiful psalm about Mount Zion and about Jerusalem. When he opens a psalm by saying, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And while this isn't the house of the Lord, surely it is the place in which we can worship God like they did in the temple in Jerusalem. And it's good to be here this morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. And of course, on the other hand, it is a little bitter for me because as this is the last time that I get to speak to you all as a group, it reminds me just how quickly this summer is coming to a close. And I'd like to take just a moment, since this is my last time to address you all as a congregation, to just, to just thank you for all the ways in which you, as individuals here, everyone has played their part in, in bringing me here and welcoming me and showing me love and being a blessing and an encouragement to me. Even when you weren't directly saying anything to me that was an encouragement, Still, by seeing your love here for one another and by seeing the things that you do here one another, you've been an immense encouragement to me, an immense impetus for growth in my life. So I'd just like to thank you all this morning. Of course, this isn't the last time that I speak. I will be speaking in the lectureship with Jason and Neil Trimblett on Saturday. And as we look forward to that event, to that study about youth, I thought it was appropriate to take this time to talk about our youth. And our, our lesson this morning is going to ask a double-sided question. First of all, why do young people leave the faith? And on the other side of that question, what can we do about it? Because, of course, we don't only want to understand the problem. We want to understand what we as individuals can do, what part we each can play to solve that problem. So this morning... What might be an influence of this problem? What might cause young people to leave the faith, specifically young people, perhaps more than older people? What reasons might cause young people especially to leave the faith? Well, first of all, just like most deficiencies in societies or moral failings in people, young or old, this problem, just like those things, I feel like begins in the home. Because the home is the place where you develop your beliefs and your values. Your parents, as they raise you, whoever raises you, they supply your core values and your core beliefs and your core priorities. And so, even in the age of teenage rebellion, as, as young people try to begin to foster their own faith or their own belief about how this world works and what's important in this world, even as they try to throw off perhaps the yoke of their, their parents' beliefs, still the influences that, that parents give to their children cannot be erased, cannot be undone. That sticks with their children forever. And so how might parents behave in such a way as to influence their children, whether believing or unbelieving children at first, whether believing or unbelieving parents who raise their children, how can they behave in such a way that when their child does take the faith, when their child does call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, how can they behave in such a way that might make that faith weak and might cause them to leave the faith? Well, first of all, they can misrepresent Christianity. And both believing parents and unbelieving parents can do this. Christian parents, by living a hypocritical life, can misrepresent Christianity. Perhaps in the church building, when they're gathered with their brothers and sisters in Christ, they speak well of one another, they act kindly toward one another, they show love toward one another, but behind closed doors, in the privacy of their own homes, perhaps that facade breaks apart, perhaps they use that time to speak badly of their brothers and sisters, to spread hate and to spread false rumors or gossip or any other sort of slanderous thing. Or perhaps they're involved in all sorts of different unchristian-like behaviors. And so what the child sees is that, first of all, there's a lot of, a lot of 
unpleasant activity that comes with being a Christian. At least that's what they might see as they are young, before they understand the faith. And even after they might understand the faith, they see that their parents obviously don't take the faith very seriously, or it would change their lives. And so they see that their parents obviously don't value the faith truly. And even if they do take the faith, that can be a demoralizing thing for young people. How else might they behave to affect their children's faith? I think more on a broad spectrum, they can teach faulty priorities. And of course, this is something that is a danger for any parent. And it's a danger because it's so easy for individuals, whether they're parents or not, to have false priorities, to, to place importance on things of this life more than on the things of the next life. That's a danger for us all, one we struggle with daily. But that can, can follow through into parenthood. And so there are many ways in which parents might teach, even unthinkingly, even subconsciously teach their children to prioritize the things of this life more than the things of the next life. They can prioritize community over morality by encouraging them to, to socialize with people in, in atmospheres that might not be entirely wholesome for them, to allow them to go maybe to parties or get-togethers that don't really provide a good setting for young people, just because they want to promote social growth and social well-being for their children. They can prioritize physical successes over strength of character and pursuit of truth. They can prioritize physical worldly pursuits over spiritual goals. And this is something that perhaps we all struggle with and is a special trap for parents. You know, there are lots of parents who talk to their kids about how they're doing in school or how they're doing with their homework and how football practices are going or how they did in the game the other day or how dance lessons are doing or whatever their child might be involved in. They talk to them about those things all the time because they want to be involved in their children's life. But how often do parents talk to their children about how they're doing in their Bible study or how they're doing in their prayer life if they're of the age that they know how to pray? And so if parents unthinkingly put more emphasis on this physical life, on the accomplishments that they can get in this life, it becomes very easy for children to set more store in those things and then in the things of a spiritual nature, than the things of a spiritual life. And so those are just a couple ways that the problem can begin in the home. But we realize that sometimes there are parents who do everything they can, do everything they know how to do to influence their children to have a strong faith, to provide a strong foundation for their children's faith. And sometimes they they do teach the right priorities, but still that child might leave the faith. And so we might want to ask other reasons, other influences why children might leave the faith. And I think possibly the second most dangerous influence is the influence of society. This society in which we live is based upon a philosophy called post Modernism. And the main tenet, the main theme of that philosophy is the rejection of truth. And this philosophy is, is basically contradictory to almost everything taught in the scriptures. In this society, we hear this, this mantra repeated over and over to our children. Be yourself. Be the person that you are. Be true to yourself. And the idea that we get is that it doesn't really matter who you are growing up as a young person as long as you're just true to who you want to be. And so eventually what becomes the standard of right and wrong to our young children is what do you want to do? What seems right to you? And that's how we encourage young people. And that's how many grown adults think today because they have been raised in that similar society. And what this does is it provides a sliding scale of morality to the point that eventually nothing is taboo. Nothing is banned indefinitely. No act is indefinitely 
disreputable. We see this especially in the sexual revolution that has taken place over the last 40 years, the influx and the increase in divorce and extramarital and premarital sex and other things of that nature, the, the welcome embrace of homosexual lifestyles that we have seen in this culture. Of course, many years ago, that wasn't accepted. And many years ago, if someone knew that this is how America would be, that would be frightening and, and disgusting to them. But this is a sliding scale, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that these sort of moral standards lead to things such as pedophilia and other things that even now most people find disgusting. But in recent years, because we can say you need to be true to yourself and what you do is how you determine what's right and wrong, what you want to do is how you determine what's right and wrong, there's been a rise, a dramatic increase of support of things like pedophilia. Because the argument is made, that's just how we are. That's just how we're oriented. We can't help that we're attracted to children. And so we should be allowed to do that. And so in that way, in many other ways, this society places on our children and on our young people and on our young adults all sort of twisted standards and beliefs and all sorts of false truths. And certainly we can understand how difficult it is when young Christians who are tender in the faith are bombarded by all these terrible standards, all these twisted lies that society is placing on them. How difficult it would be for them to be holy and to be light in this dark world. And so surely the influence of society is dangerous. The influence of society can ruin a young person's faith and cause him to leave the faith. And of course... Society and that influence of the fluctuations and the movement that society undergoes really does seem to take more of an effect on our young people because young people are less set in their ways than older people are, and especially older Christians. Older Christians more understand where they are in life and who they are. And the journey of, of self-identity is one that not every young person has, has completed. And so... Ultimately, one disadvantage that works against young people is their youth. And there are a number of ways in which youth might be a disadvantage to them. I think, personally, in my experience, my limited observation of this life, I truly believe that it is easier for young people to be entranced by the cares of the world, to be enveloped by the appeals that this world can make. Older Christians, as, as they reach their later years especially, they can see the, the decay of their body, the running down of the physical universe and, and the way that time seems to slip away. I feel like I'm there myself sometimes with my joint pain, but they see the, the quick... It's true, it's true. They see the, the, the negative things of this life, physical pain and, and death, and they see those things a lot more clearly, clearly than young people do. And so older Christians can more easily yearn for that, that home beyond that seas or beyond, the, beyond death, beyond this life, that home that we all ought to be looking forward to. But young people, they have all these accomplishments ahead of them, especially young teenagers as they're going in to their late teenage years. They can go to college. They can get a degree there. They can start their career choose a spouse, start a family, begin their financial empire and all the goals and achievements that come with that. And when all those things, you, you can have them to look forward to. When a child or a young person can look forward to all those accomplishments and all those appeals of life, surely those are wonderful things in this life, but they can allow those to distract them from their true home. And I feel like that's a danger that's especially potent to our young people. And also the vigor of age, the vitality of youth, is something that can steal Christians from the faith, young Christians from the faith. There's, there's advice that is given even by older people that just astounds me why any older person would give this advice, but it's the advice to sow your wild oats. And the idea is that 
there are things in this life that when you're young, you can do and you can enjoy. Because you have that vitality, you have freedom that comes from youth. When in a few years you're, you're trapped in a career, or maybe you're involved in a career, you might enjoy it, you might not feel trapped, but you are involved in a career full time, and maybe you'll have a family, and of course you want to spend time with them. And so people sometimes encourage young people to, to throw off restraint and do in these young years what you can't do later. What does the, this, the Bible, what do scripture, scripture say about this advice to sow your wild oats? Wisdom says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the words of the preacher in verse 9 says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Yes, enjoy these times when you can have the freedom and vitality of youth. Enjoy the blessings of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. And skipping down just a couple of verses, in the first verse of chapter 12, remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before age comes, and while you have that, that desire to enjoy your youth, while you're doing that, remember your Creator in the days of your youth, young people. And remember that the things you do now, the acts that you perform now will be brought into judgment. And so surely, in that way, youth can be a disadvantage. The attraction to this world, the, the anchor to this world, can be a disadvantage to young people. And of course, young people are, are in many ways devoid of the wisdom and experience that, that come to older people as they live through this life and experience on the godly path, experience this life, and they store up their wisdom. So youth itself can be a disadvantage that might influence young people to leave the faith, leave their faith. And of course, we would not complete this lesson if we didn't talk about the very real and very serious danger posed to our young people, the danger of evil companions. We know that really this problem can affect anybody. Take Solomon for a perfect example. Even in his old age, even when he had the wisdom that God had given him, he allowed his wives and his concubines to pull him away from the real and true and living God to follow false and dead and man-made gods. And so while this problem, this danger, can affect really anybody, just like society affects younger people more than older people, I believe that this problem of evil companions is more of a danger to young people than it is to older Christians who might, as we said before, be more set in their ways, be more mindful of their companions, and be more mindful of the people with whom they spend their time. Let us look at one brief example of, of a young man falling into this trap. But first, of course, the, uh, the statement from Paul, this timeless truth that he makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 when he says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Of course, in the context, he's talking about brothers in Christ who preach that there is no resurrection. But surely this principle applies to all companions and in all times. Bad company ruins good morals. What's an example of this? We can read in Second Chronicles of a, a king named Joash, who had as, his, had as his advisor a priest by the name of Jehoiada. And it says, beginning in verse 15, but Jehoiada grew old and full of days and died. He was 130 years old at his death, and they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel and toward God and his house. Now after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. We see this king who for many years was, was called a good king in God's sight. And under the, the advice and guidance of the priest Jehoiada, he did many good things in God's sight. But he allowed evil companions to steal him away from the Lord. And the real problem facing our children along the lines of evil companions is the fact that evil companions aren't wearing flashing neon signs of caution saying, 
I'm a bad person. You don't need to spend time around me. I'm going to be a bad example to you. Unfortunately, in the places that young people might feel the most secure in choosing their companions, places like the church, these places might contain evil companions. And so there's a danger as, as young children, young people in the faith, seek out good companions to spend their time with. Seek out, in all, all honesty and all sincerity, good people to spend their time with. And they look to the members of the church for that strength, for that friendship. Sometimes it's the people of the church, the young companions of the church especially, who can draw Christians away. I can't count the number of children, but I know it's in the dozens. The, num- the number of young people who have been drawn away because their friends in Christ compromised their holiness and they fell away and wandered from the Lord and they drew away their friends with them. So we cannot underestimate the danger of evil companions. Now, finally, there are a few specific reasons, reasons specific to young Christians who grew up in Christian homes and people who might have taken the faith themselves when their parents weren't believers, but they came to the faith themselves. Speaking of Christians who were raised in a Christian home, there is what I have come to call the curse of the Christian home. Now, surely it's a blessing. Surely it's a a wonderful thing to be raised in a Christian home by Christian parents. I'm I'm not denying that. That's a wonderful thing, but there is a potential danger there. When young people are exposed from a very young age to the gospel on Sundays and Wednesdays, and they're exposed to this their entire life, there is a danger that this can become boring or that they can become jaded by the gospel. If their parents don't immerse them, if parents don't immerse their children in the gospel every day of their life and show their children that the gospel and the faith is the source of all truth, it is the answer to all the questions in this life, it is the source of life eternal. If their idea of the gospel doesn't become incorporated in everything they do, there can unconsciously become a separation between what they do here at the building, what their parents do here at the building, and what they do in the rest of their life. And when that separation occurs, what can happen is that the faith takes the back seat because, of course, it's something that they only spend time doing Sundays and maybe Wednesdays. And so when their faith is tested, when they become Christians, when they follow that natural course and that natural influence to become Christians later in life, usually that's the course that is taken when children are raised in a Christian home. When they do that, and they don't have their faith and their hope and their joy and their peace set on the gospel, what happens is when their faith is tested, their faith loses. And so surely the curse of the Christian home, while it is a blessing to be raised in a Christian home, that can be a danger to our young people as well. And what about people who weren't raised in Christian homes? About Christians who had unbelieving parents but found the faith themselves, perhaps through sincere and honest study of God's Word, whether by themselves or with other Christians. I would suggest that unmet expectations can be a source of negative influence on these young people's faith. Perhaps young people are are drawn to a local church because they they see a sense of belonging, a sense of family, a sense of fellowship and social closeness that young people yearn for. And they see that in a local church from outside and they see love and and they, they perceive looking from the outside that this church is practicing the truth and they're doing exactly what the Bible says as, as they know how to do. And so they become attracted to the faith and, and they join the work there. Maybe they're baptized there, maybe not. Maybe they were baptized before and they chose that church. But what if when they go there and they join that group, that image of love and of truth and of obedience to God just falls apart? What if they discover infightings and, and slander among the Christians at that church? And what if they discover hypocrisy and wickedness, surely that can be enough to take anybody away from the faith. But when 
you have those expectations of how Christianity should be, and a local church affects you in that way, surely that can be a negative influence on the faith. And so the, the question is tonight, or sorry, this morning, what can we do about this problem? What can we do about the negative influences that are harming our young people's faith and can be potentially lethal to our young people in their spiritual walk? Surely we all have a part to play. There's nothing that we can't do. And that is essential to our understanding of what we can do. The fact that every single one of us can do something for these young people. First of all, as we began in the home, I'd, I'd say we would want to start with that as well as we talk about what can we do about being godly parents. How can we be those parents that don't misrep misrepresent Christianity, that don't teach faulty priorities? We learn in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 that if you train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And while that's not true 100% of the time, as we mentioned before, sometimes godly parents doing all that they can still suffer the loss of a child. That's true most of the time. That's true the vast majority of the time. And so how can we train up a child in the right way? There's a very valuable principle that's taught to us by Moses. As he gives the law back to the children of Israel, as he's about to move on, as they're about to enter the promised land, he, he, he reminds them of the covenant that they made with Yahweh. And he says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Immersing your children day by day in the faith, in the teachings of God's word. Not prioritizing physical things over spiritual things. Not spending more time speaking with them about what they're doing in school or in their extracurricular activities than you do speaking to them about the faith. But rather, making them understand what the gospel is day after day. We see a picture painted here of 24-7 guidance. We see a picture painted here of parents who are doing everything they can, using every moment they have with their children to impart knowledge of the faith on them. Surely providing that good foundation is important. I don't believe for a second that any parent here doesn't take that role very seriously. But we need to be understanding. We need to be aware of what we can do as parents. What we must do as parents to give our children a good foundation of morals and beliefs and values. And also, as a group, as a church, and even as individuals in a church, we can provide community. As we mentioned before, that's something that young people are looking forward to a great deal. That is something that young people, perhaps more than older Christians, really value and reach out to. And so, by providing community, by providing relationships here, we solve two problems. First, we solve the problem of the influence of society by providing a refuge from the world, by providing good companions here that they can spend their time with and escape some of the influence of society. While that cannot be completely escaped, it is sort of a refuge here. And of course, the other danger of evil companions, we here can offer good and pure and holy relationships to young Christians and in doing that provide a, a good influence for them to be strong in the faith, to provide a good resource for them. But remember that danger that we talked about. Remember that potential danger of, of us, ourselves, compromising our morals and, and being drawn away from the faith, of, of making even small compromises that, that take away our holiness and influence other Christians to do the same. Brothers and sisters, whether or not you're young, old, or whatever, do not compromise your faith. Do not compromise 
your morality. Because in doing that, not only do you endanger yourself, but you endanger all those young and tender Christians who might not know the difference between what's right and wrong, might not know the difference between a good companion and a compromised Christian companion. Do not compromise your values. If you do that, you provide such a dangerous influence for our young people. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That is something we ought to do not only here, but also in casual relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ, our young people outside of this service, outside of these assemblies. We need to take as example what the early Christians did at the beginning of the church. In Acts 2, in verse 42 and 46, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. That's something they did day by day. Because in that time, they recognized just how useful this resource is, just how useful it is to have good companions, to have those good influences in your life. And surely that's something that young people cannot go without. It's something that young people need as essential. And so each and every one of us can provide community. And of course, we mentioned that youth is a disadvantage to young people. We mentioned that they lack wisdom, and so that's something that our older and more wise Christian men and women can provide us, because you have it in abundance, and we have a severe lack of it. Of course, true wisdom and true guidance and true understanding comes from the Word of God. But there are specific instances, there are specific circumstances in this life that are not explicitly directed or not specifically addressed in the scriptures. And while the, while the principles in the Bible are more than sufficient to guide us, sometimes it's, it's more convenient and sometimes it's more eye-opening to young people if they have an, a godly older Christian man or woman who has been down that road, who has lived life navigating by the principles set in God's word and can lead them down the right path as well and can offer them wisdom and guidance. At this point, it's, it's important for our young people to recognize your responsibility in this matter, especially in reference to the wisdom and guidance that older Christians can provide for us. We need to realize that we need to be open to that guidance. Don't think you have all the answers because you don't. Don't think you can do it by yourself because you can't. Young people, take advice from older people. Take advice from brother our brother Paul, as he wrote to a young man, being an older man himself, having wisdom through the revelation of God and through years of experience. He said to Timothy, a young man, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And in his next letter, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, he says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. If as a young person you're doing this, if you're making the effort to take this advice and be an example to others, it'll be much easier for you to be strong in your faith. But when we think about what we can do for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for these young people who might be wandering from the faith or have already left the faith, when we ask what can we do, what we're really asking is what must we do? It's not about making the choice about whether or not we're going to do something or not. Of course, we do have that choice, but if we're living according to the gospel, if we're living as God wants us to live, if we're being the right Christian brother or sister, there is no choice. These young people and every other soul is a soul that Christ himself, God himself, died for on the cross. And so their value is beyond comprehension. Their value is not something that we can take lightly. 
And the Bible is very outspoken about our duty, not our option, our responsibility to young people to help them if they're wandering from the faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14 says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. In James 5 and verse 19, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. What a beautiful idea that we can save a wandering soul from death and bring him back to life, that we can reverse that horrible process of spiritual death and save a soul. Finally, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do this every day. Is this something we do every day as we have the opportunity? Or is it something that we do if we get the chance on Sunday mornings or evenings or perhaps even Wednesday nights? Young Christians who are struggling or have left the faith, they need more than that. And I think we know what it is we can do and what it is we should do. What we need to do is something. Don't abandon the, those young people in the faith. Do what you can. Do everything you can because remember, Christ died for them. And so if, when we ask what can we do about it, what can we do about young people leaving the faith, what we need to do is something. We need to do our part. Young or old, this morning, what is your situation from God? Have you allowed your relationship with God to shrivel and to decay, or have you been strong in the Lord? If, you, if there's anything we've learned this morning, it's that we need the help of one another. We need to lean on this resource of one another. We don't need to neglect the strength that we have as a group. And so if there's a problem that you have, if there's a need that you have and want to make known to us this morning, don't hesitate to lean on us. We love you. Let us help you. If there's any way we can help you, let us know even now as we stand and sing.